to just kind of get started with. So, hello, and welcome to the Houston Museum of African American Culture. My name is Christopher Blay. I am the chief curator here, and it is my distinct honor and pleasure to uh, have a conversation here today, the final day of the Bert Long Jr. Gallery Spring Survey Exhibition with these seven amazing artists, and there's an eighth who is on his way, presumably. But um, the show, but well, before I get into all of that, I, I first want to thank uh, my uh, CEO and director, John Guest Jr., in the back there, who is very instrumental in making this museum a possibility and making these exhibitions happen. So thank you, John. And uh, I would also like to thank our board of directors, all our uh, donors and patrons. Uh, if you walk into the lobby, on the wall of the lobby, you'll see the names of all our uh, donors and supporters, including the um, Help me, John. The supporters uh, for this exhibition. Houston Endowment. Houston Endowment. H-E-B. H-E-B. Stardust. Stardust Fund. Jones Walker. Jones Walker. And the Board of Directors. And the Board of Directors. I know the money. So, <laughs> <laughs> he knows the money part. Uh, so we're, we're really grateful for all that support because it makes something like this survey exhibition possible. Um, I'm gonna go around the room and have each of these artists introduce themselves, and we're gonna just dive right into it. Uh, there's a lot to talk about, um, and if you haven't already, before you leave here today, I wanna to invite you into the downstairs gallery where all their works are present, uh, and you can just uh, get a better context of what we talk about in here. So uh, we'll start with you, Lamont. Um. I'm Lamont French, a multi-disciplinary artist from Houston, Texas. Uh, my name is Saron Alderson, and uh, I'm an artist who makes things out of stuff. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm now based here in Houston, Texas. My name is Mark Francis. I'm a mixed media portraitist uh, from Houston, Texas. My name is Kayla Maria Cairoy. Hey everyone, my name is Preston Gaines. I'm an artist and an architect, um, as well as a furniture designer, um, and a number of other things. Botanical wizard. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've been in Houston since 2008, so I, I'd say I'm from Houston at this point. came about was going to studio visits um, at these artists' individual studios and just talking with them about their work, talking about their process, talking about uh, their motivations and uh, the thing, I'll tell you the story, uh, Kema was the first person to reach out to me because I was looking for uh, artists to do studio visits with and her proactive uh, impulse was the germinating seed that created this exhibition uh, and connected me to all these artists. So, Kaywa, thank you very much. Uh, so, I, I went to Kaywa's studio, and I'll tell you the other part later, but the striking thing about this, uh, this process was it revealed to me artists that are extremely interconnected, not only because they, they their studios are all in proximity to each other, but they're aware of each other's works, they support each other, um, they, they talk about each other, they, they show up for each other, and it is a very endearing thing because it, it separates the process from you know, I'm an artist, I'm in my studio, I'm gonna be successful all by myself, nobody's gonna help me, I'm not gonna help anybody, I'm gonna rise to the top. Uh, that conversation was nowhere present in any of these studio visits. So my first question, uh, came up since you started all this thing, I wanna talk to you about that. How, talk to me about uh, how being in proximity to other artists Form your work and then a little bit about your, your work and your process. Um, so I guess the first question, I think that, so little background, it was Crystal and I's first year in the MFA program um, at U of H, um, which kind of revealed a lot about my personal practice. I realized that I work at a mechanical um, speed. Okay. And I was very hard on myself. I think that being in proximity of other artists kind of made me understand that I didn't have to be hard on myself. The amount that I'm producing was my process and it didn't belong to anybody else. And kind of seeing other people's process made it, I guess, digestible. You know, it's like, okay, it allowed me to give myself a lot more grace. Um, when it came to, I guess, our vernacular, putting people on. <laughs> um, I mean, I realized a long time ago that the cheat code to success was collaboration. Um, Somebody write that down. <laughs> I mean, it, it really is. And, and, and just, you know, nobody's success is going to impede on my success, right? Um, and really just, it kind of brings you joy to see other people, I mean, maybe not everybody, but it brings me joy <laughs> to see other people succeed. Like, and, you know, I can personally say that Mark has been integral as well. Like him and I, we piggyback all the time. We share constantly. And the thing is, we're both collage artists. And you would think, you would think that, no, no, don't, don't touch that, you know? Um, but really, like, we just like, hey, 
here's a framer, here's this. What about this person? This person hit you up. Um, here's a collector, here's this. You know, so we constantly go back and forth. So it was nothing. Like I was like, Chris, talk to this person, this person, this person. And then I hit everyone up and I was like, hey, if he doesn't reach out, you reach out to him because let him know about it. Yeah. Um, and so to me, it's just, I don't know. It's about, it, it's it's this, what do you say, cross pollination and just. Yeah. Yeah. Talk to me about that. Um, I want to talk with you, <laughs> Lamont, because uh, I reached out to a few artists in Houston. I, I've only moved here like three and a half years ago, so I'm still getting to know the landscape. I feel I'm still getting to know the artists and the communities. Um, and I reached out to another artist that um, told me I should visit the mom studio, which I did. Uh, and although your studio space is also in kind of like a space of community, it feels like you're kind of an outlier in um, like having a studio that's pretty much isolated to yourself. How, how, how has your experience been with that? Um, well, the, the way that I met you was uh, my cousin, El Franco Lee, who was, uh, you know, Franco, since we were kids, he was like my big brother in anything that I did. He was always like, I need to do that, I need to do that. So 10 years ago, when I decided to, uh, you know, to start making paintings, uh, he just kind of told me to, to take it serious and make as much work as I could. Yeah. And, He's, uh, you know, he's been such a big influence just on my life. So for him to be the catalyst as well as to push me to take art seriously, uh, you know, it's kind of special to me. But um, my studio practice, uh, it, it kind of ranges just a little bit. Uh, you know, I have a, a big layer of land. So where you came and met me uh, is where my year-long residency was for the Harris County Cultural Arts Center. Okay. Um, and that's where I met you. totally separate show. Yeah. But the piece that is actually in the group show was from my show Memoirs of Love and Hate in November. Okay. Um, and the titles uh, and the band played on. And what I did with that piece because it was so large was I tried to take multiple stories of what's going okay. on. Okay, David, come have a seat over here. I'm sorry. Go ahead, continue. Okay. Uh, um, I just try to take multiple stories of what's going on in the social climate, uh, whether it be fashion, um, you know, politics, uh, you know, just the, the diaspora of living life on a day to day basis. Yeah. And um, it's funny because during the artist talk, Kama came and she said something to me and it kind of made me realize about this painting. There's a, a giant uh, black face yeah. that's in the middle of it. And how I was explaining it was I was, I was giving it from an experience of, you know, speaking of, from a culture. Mm -hmm. And she was like, I feel like that is actually you. And she made me realize that is me. It, it's, it's the story that's being told is from left to right. It's the story of just my life up until this point. Okay. But that piggybacks off of us all knowing each other's work and supporting each other and then, you know, just dropping tidbits into what and I can go even further back to where, um, you know, I was maybe a budding artist at the time, and Mark had a podcast, and he interviewed me, and, uh, you know, he, he told me after that, he was like, man, you know, you find, he's like, you're a really good artist, he's like, once you find your voice, yeah, you're gonna, everything is gonna open up, and uh, I think maybe two years ago, I had a show coming off of COVID, Okay. And he came to the show and he told me, he said, man, you finally found your voice. So it's, it's just kind of, when I saw the list of the artists that were, um, you know, in the show, seeing those two uh, kind of make you say, and of course, like you say, El Franco sent you my way, but seeing those two, I was like, <laughs> Okay, so um, on the topic of finding your voice, uh, Crystal, you're probably the youngest artist on this panel. Uh, <laughs> so, at least I 
<laughs> so as a young artist making paintings in a graduate school program uh, with your peers here on the panel, do you feel like you found your voice yet, or do you, where where are you in the process of finding your voice, so to speak? <laughs> Yeah, I've, the conversation we had last Tuesday with the artist upstairs, uh, Evita Tizano, uh, I posed this question to her about uh, the experience of uh, being, uh, not necessarily going through the, the, the big grad school program uh, and how it affected her, her voice. And, uh, and she said something, if I'm, remembering correctly about people telling her that grad school was really gonna like uh, change her work and like change it into and mold it into different directions. Do you feel like, like how do you feel about your work versus the experience of grad school? I resonate with that part a lot. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> you, you feel like it's changing your, your, your voice like, or your, your work? tried and also kind of has, but not in the way it has Okay. Okay. Um, like the meteor. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Kat, you're uh, you're still in the program. You just graduated. Yes. Okay. Congratulations. <laughs> uh, and uh, talk about your experience both with the grad group school program. Because you're like me, when I was in college, I was sort of like the, the, how should I put it, the one that, that wasn't fresh out of high school. <laughs> right. And, uh, <laughs> so, you know, you come to art with some life experience, but you also are part of this program that, uh, that tries to, to, to keep things fresh and a fresh perspective. How, how, how do you navigate that uh, coming, coming with some life experience, and then like being in a program that that uh, maybe pushes back a little bit? Yeah, yeah. It, I don't feel like the program was heavy handed. Um, I feel like for myself, I was able to assert and bring out the things that were important to me, uh, parts of the culture that made sense to me yeah. from my own uh, family and life experience. Um, I have. <clears throat> I feel like it helped me to like uh, focus and 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 kind of like I don't know arrowhead like in the directions in which I needed to go. Um, it wasn't a, a, a type of thing that um, that I didn't feel like I could express myself um, in reference to my professors and everything. I. I really enjoyed the experience with them. Yeah. Um, and uh, I feel like they brought out the best in me. And so um, being really uh, in tune with history and family history, mm -hmm. I felt like it gave me opportunities to research where I, as I might have just been making work and just going like a machine, basically. And it, like, I took pause. Yeah. I was able to do a lot more reading. A lot more research, and so my my practice became a more research based practice. And then, like in, in instance where I went to Africa Town, I formed a collective, the Black Women's Road Trip Collective. But Saran was with me in that part of that, yeah, yeah, in our southern pilgrimage um, to Africa Town. And I felt like that grad school experience encouraged it. It yeah. definitely <laughs> financed it. Yeah, that's a, that's a big part. It's a good part. Yeah. Uh, Saran, talk to me about that experience. Um, and I want to say that Saran is uh, Saran and Lamont.
have the two biggest paintings in the exhibition. <laughs> <laughs> and so there, it's just like a really outside experience to walk into, which is great because I feel like it balances everything else out. He chose that. <laughs> I did choose that. I did. I did that. Uh, but uh, talk to me about, because I see a connection when uh, Kat is talking about the road trip experience and uh, uh, Kema is talking about you know, this sort of uh, connectedness. Uh, your work is, uh, you know, you're, you're part of that program and your studio is in proximity to these other artists. But uh, talk about the community both inside and outside of, of the program. Yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, yeah, so Kat and I met the first year of grad school on Zoom. Uh, and we were in some class and her video was on and she made this one face to something that somebody said. <laughs> and afterwards, I was like, oh, we're going to be friends. <laughs> immediately started to like, chat with her and basically stalk her until she was my friend. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, after I did my long grooming session of making her my friend, she, uh, when she wanted to go to Africa Town, I, she invited me to come along. And we met up with a former grad from uh, University of Houston, Jimmy Robinson. And uh, the three of us trekked across uh, the, the Deep South during the height of COVID <laughs> to go check out a piece of history. And it actually was really uh, integral to my experience in grad school because it made me realize something about my work. I was, I was a little lost. Like, we spent a lot of time in the car, like, gabbing, like, ah. and, um, and, like, we went and we saw, like, we, like, learned about some heavy stuff, right? Like, we were filming in swamps. We literally had to save Cat from, like, falling into his quicksand, like. <laughs> instead to like memorialize this like really amazing fun time that three black women safely traveling through the deep south during a global pandemic and so like I, I ended up making work that was like kind of a dick joke that we made along the way you know so it was still this important thing but it was like the way like anyway it just made me realize that maybe like I really wanted to maybe make a lot of dick jokes about the great things in life. <laughs> so um, that's kind of <laughs> how this community That's kind of how this community started. Yeah, and everyone, <laughs> and everyone is all like, yes, my friend, are like, thank you, yeah, high five. You go make your dick jokes. Uh, that will like bring a little bit of joy when uh, a lot of times people ask us to make things about really heavy stuff. Yeah. Uh, I want to have a conversation between Mark and David. Uh, and I will give you a proper introduction. This is David Stutz. He's the eighth artist in the exhibition. Uh, his work is the video work that's in the gallery. It's a three minute long uh, black and white video that's really endearing. It has a very strong positive message. And uh, I think what I feel, my connection to Mark's work uh, uh, is also this kind of walk into the community, uh, spending time with folks in, uh, I, in all my wards mixed up, so you're gonna have to tell me, because I'm not from here. Fifth Ward, so his work is based in the Fifth Ward, and uh, he does these really beautiful uh, portrait collages of uh, folks in that community, that's one aspect of your work. And when I look at David's videos, it's the most like Houston videos you can <laughs> ever encounter. You know, it, it has a little bit of culture. It has a little bit of uh, sort of like an ode to Houston. Uh, it doesn't shy away from uh, these really strong uh, conversations we're having against uh, about state violence against black people. So I, I feel like you're coming to a, a similar conversation from two different ends of the street. So I want you both to address that. Well, we actually started having kind of that conversation about our work at John's house, the night of the opening, like toward the end of that, well left. And I mean, it's, it's, it's rooted in, you know, we're talking in 
our work doesn't come from a place of like scholarship of old masses. It comes from a place of like these are the people around me and they're beautiful. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, and that is the most important thing in the work that I do. Whether you know, I get comparisons to these artists that have all these classical trainings and things like that, and I'm like, that's cool. <laughs> but hopefully, my work doesn't feel like that. Yeah, I want my work to feel like you go into the corner store to get you some candy, maybe a hot pickle. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Or you see your dad's friend at the car wash. Hey, young blood, what's going on? I want it to feel like that. And if it don't feel like that, then I'm not doing my job, yeah. right? Because these are people that. These are, these are my people. These are the people I grew up around. This is the way I grew up. And I want to embody that spirit in a way that's true to the subjects of the work. So I make it a point to talk to these people, convene with these people. And I keep having these conversations with folks about, why don't you use this material? Why don't you use that material? Make it go faster. I don't want the process to go faster. I want the process to go slow because this is my way of spending even more time with these subjects yeah. so that I can imbue this work with the energy that so that when you stand in front of that work, you're like, yo, this feel like my boy. Like, this feel like my uncle, this feel like my cousin, right? Um, and I think I, I've gotten spoiled a little bit because I was able to like see how the work, I, I did my solo show of this work in Fifth Ward. Okay. And I was able to see how people connected with it directly, right? So, in this age now where we're talking about the vulnerability of black men and, and all these different things, man. Like I got to see folks like corner boys come in there and be like, yo, this is incredible. Start to shed a little tear, you know what I'm saying? Like one guy can't think he's like, man, this is my boy. We've been cool since like we was in fifth grade. <laughs> and he stood there and he watched the video done by uh, one of my good friends, uh Chap Edmondson. And he stood there watching the video and he he started to kind of sink, relax a little bit, lean on his girlfriend, and like standing there looking at him from the back, like I could tell that he was he was getting emotional. Yeah. And it was because he saw his neighborhood the way, like portrayed by someone else in the way that he sees it yeah. when he wakes up, when he goes outside. So and I, you know, mm -hmm. to pass it to David, I think that's the same. Same approach you have in your work, and you know similar feelings for the people in the neighborhood. So it's similar. Uh, I always tell people mine is my accident. Um, I kind of was like submerged in what was happening, and I was always able to have kind of like this bird's eye view of what was happening. And I didn't know what it was at first. You know, I was like, yeah, hey, what is this? And I didn't realize that I was watching what we see now. What I caught it early. So I caught it when I was 15. Like being around screw nails, like I knew it was special, but I didn't know everybody talked so bad about it, but it was a beautiful thing. So I would never let them change my view of what this was. Yeah. And I just I would stand firm and just be like, man, this is the most beautiful thing I've seen. I don't know what I'm supposed to do with it. And and actually the camera was caught up. Uh, at that time, I think it wasn't a lot of outlets for artists. It was real like, if you drew, you drew for your buddies. If you shot photos, you shot for your family. It wasn't a, a platform for you to just perform on. Yeah. And I just kind of hung around and just was a part of the movie. I ended up becoming a part of it, but I always was able to stay and be able to see it from this different thing. So I watched the culture merge I watched it go from two different things to one thing. I watched it go to the early 2000s. I saw all the rappers do what they were supposed to do. I saw that. I watched it from a bird's eye view. Then I was able to become a part of it. That part was where it, uh, you, had to, you had to have a lot of discipline because there was a lot of potholes and, <laughs> and things along the way. You know what I mean? Because they, you, you're around all these amazing people and you have all this amazing access and you still have to kind of have the discipline to be able to say, I need to document this. I don't need to be individual. I have to stay behind the camera. So it was a whole lot of me being disciplined. And then what happened is just, I just became so a part of what was happening is I was just, I just, when I looked up, it was 10 years later. 
Yeah. You know, wow. it literally happened like that. Wow. You know, and when I look back, that's when I, I didn't really look back at nothing to 2021. It's like I went back mm -hmm. and I looked at all my old stuff. I was like, man, do we, do we don't even know I got this. Like, <laughs> so I started like combing through it. Yeah. And I realized that it was a story there. So now I'm trying to pull that story out mm -hmm. so that everybody can see it. You know okay. Yeah, that's that's incredible, and that's that's the thing about this this group of artists. It's like you're touching on things that are that I I just I just think it's I have yet to see, and maybe it's already happened and I wasn't there, but like this feels like the most Houston of Houston exhibitions, <laughs> and I want I yeah I want to keep it like that. Uh, uh, Preston. You, I, I mean, talking about listening to David, uh, it, you know, it's like this, you know, from this bird's eye view, this sort of like uh, macro, macro observation and like building things, you know, it, it, it makes me think about your work. Uh, you are an architect, you're also an artist, you're an observer, you, uh, you build things, you, you grow things. Um, and it's just like a, a, a unique perspective uh, on uh, art making. It, it, it combines a lot of different elements. So talk to me about you know starting as an architect and then transforming your thinking about the way things are built into um, the way you fuse your creative process with that. Yeah, thank you. But yeah, I, I think for me, um, you know, similar to David, I, I, you know, I've been an architect for about like 10 years, leading up to, uh, let's say like 2020, 20, or yeah, 2020, maybe or so, yeah. And um, I think, you know, up until that point, you know, I was on a trajectory of like, you know, working for the higher corporate firms and on that path to success and everything like that. And I think for me, there was a lot of stuff lacking um, create, creatively. And so um, I think, yeah, I just started to look for different resources um, to kind of fill this void that I was lacking, I guess. And, um, one of the ways I did so was like applying for grants. And so I applied for like, my first grant. I was able to get, get actually leave my job and um, start getting work full time. Wow. Um, and so yeah, current, Currently, I'm in a residency with the San Diego Medical Center, which allowed me um, the space and opportunity to be at U of H um, in addition to teaching in the architecture department. So <laughs> it's, um, I think, you know, my, my background in architecture clearly gave me the skill set um, to navigate, I guess, this world in the way that I want or that I'm able to yeah. um, now. And, you know, I think for me, like making these connections with individuals really. Prior to my residency, like I said, I was just teaching at the university in architecture. And then I was given the opportunity to have a space there and teach. It just, it just made sense. It was just, you know, an opportunity to give back not only to my students, but also expand myself and collaborate with my friends. Yeah. Um, so I'd, prior to the residency, um, I'd actually known, I think it's Mark, yeah, Lamont. I didn't know, I didn't know, yeah, I didn't know Kat or Chris. Yeah, we were yeah we were in our first show Robert Hodge at Forever Twenty One. That was my first show ever actually. Oh really? Where? Wow. Okay, so that <laughs> that was very recent. That was what less than two years ago. Yeah. All right. That was uh, that was when I I got my first uh, grant and yeah, Robert I, I was introduced to Robert like maybe three days prior to the show started. Oh, wow. <laughs> and then he was like, yeah, do whatever you want. And I, so yeah, I, I always tell everybody, you know, space and opportunity. There's nothing more, there's nothing better than space and opportunity. So when we give them a chance, I put everything into it. So. Yeah, I think that was the, the kind of working title of our conversation. So uh, I had a conversation with each of these artists that uh, I recorded. And it will be part of a podcast series here at the museum. So stay tuned and, and 
listen and look closely, and, and you'll be a part of that. Uh, I want to do something unconventional in this moment. Uh, I know that you're all you know, familiar with each other's works, and I want to put this question out there to any of you that want to respond, to talk about what you're curious about, about any of the other artists' works in this exhibition. subjects, how do you approach them? How do you, like, I'm curious as to how he approaches them and, and, and gains access to these people that seem larger than life at times. Yeah. Uh, it depends on who it is. I made a lot of mistakes. I don't want nobody to think I was just running around and it was just this perfect work. And then I, know, <laughs> and I must have dropped the ball 50,000 times. Like, because, like, I remember early, I, that's when I learned that things that are for you are for you and things that aren't are. And I was in some amazing situations with some amazing people. And I dropped the ball. Because I couldn't keep past who this person was. And <laughs> my brain was stopping. Like, ah, this is and as the time progressed, I knew that I needed to stay on track. Mm -hmm. And it was just a practice. And just being able to kind of read people and see it. I started looking at people for who they were instead of what I saw. Had to switch that. So imagine you showing up early, you don't really know, and nobody's teaching you. You gotta kind of teach yourself how to kind of cross that plane. And yeah. you know, like toward the end, um, when I really got big, I probably stopped when I was 18. I think Anthony Bourdain was the last big person that I got a chance to spend an uh, extended amount of time with. Wow. And at first, wow. oh, yeah, <laughs> at first he was like, he was like, hey, bro, I need you to show me around Houston. So I was like, cool. That was easy, right? I didn't know who he was. Right. I've never seen this guy in my life. You know? <laughs> so I'm noticing people come up and talk. <laughs> we go up, we go to his room, drink, talk, bars that night, go back, you know, the next day. Mm -hmm. And when he finally, when I finally figured out who he was, I was already comfortable. So it was easy oh, for me right. to, yeah, to create cool. that relationship. You get what I'm saying? And yeah. I had to do that a lot. <laughs> yeah, because man, being on there, being out in that, and where I was at, there was no rules, man. There was anything goes, and you never knew. What, and sometimes it was more so you had to be able to read the room for safety. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So that's a different kind of being able to read the room. That, you know, and once you learn that, you're kind of able to apply that even in rooms where you don't have to be out there. It's like Okay. So, it, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, it was able, so, I was just able to get it real quick. I knew what I needed to do real quick. Yeah. So, it's that, second. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that proximity to uh, fame and uh, success and uh, accomplishment is, I bet, is pretty infectious. Yeah. And although we um, present this exhibition as uh, an Emerging Artist Exhibition, because it is, uh, we named the Burt Long Junior Gallery in honor of the Houston artist Burt Long that passed away. John, when did he pass away? About 2014, 2015? No, something like that. Somewhere around there. And uh, as I understand it, he was a very strong advocate for emerging artists in Houston. And uh, yeah, so, you, although we consider the space for emerging artists, you're all artists that are, you know, in varying degrees of accomplishments. Um, so what I want to talk with you about is uh, how do you define success, and how do you, what what is your end goal? Like what what goals and uh, uh, pursuits do you? 
have for yourselves? And anyone can take this question before we kind of throw it to the audience. Is my family eating? <laughs> 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 I, think that, I, think, I think that's the that's the most simple way I can put it. I mean, as long as I'm able to feed my family of the work that I'm making, I consider that a success. Now, it don't have to be steaks and lobsters. <laughs> but, you know, it'd be nice. But, uh, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be that. But then even beyond that, um, I think for me, the success of my work is it's more than like the idea of like, oh, museum survey show, retrospective, uh, you know, history book. That's cool. You know, I, 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 I think I want that too. Um, but, you know, I want folks that grew up where I grew up and the way I grew up. I grew up in Ailey. Um, and for everybody that thinks that Ailey is just a cute little suburb, <laughs> that's a little different. <laughs> I don't think anybody thinks it so much, but I still get, I still get folks sometimes that be like, oh, you grew up in Ailey? You grew up in the suburb? <laughs> um, I mean, technically. But, uh, but no, like, I want, you know, to get to the museum, it was an hour and a half bus ride. Mm -hmm. Before the age of 20, I went to the Museum of Fine Arts once. Wow. And between 20 and 30, I think I went there once. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, <laughs> that's just what it is, you know? Um, and I want the children that are growing up in the space that grew up, the adults, the elders, I want them to see themselves in my work. I'm not interested in, in, in you know, I don't really care about the, the, the academic accolades. I care about the people. Yeah, you know I'm saying I want them to build themselves in the work. Kara, do you feel the same way? Actually, yeah. Um, <laughs> so I kind of struggle. I I create at the same pace in two different mediums. Mm -hmm. um, as an artist, one of the things that I guess people are more established tell you is you need to pick one. You want success, you need to pick one. So the problem is, okay, which one? Because it's not like I'm picking, it's not like I'm, I'm doing one over the other. Like I'm producing the same amount of work at the same amount of speed. But one thing that resonated with me that my partner told me is that Yes, one does come across more commercial than fine art. My problem is, does that gain me the same amount of respect that, that I want in the long term? And he said, the commercial is reaching people who may not be as you know adept to what fine art is. And if you can reach people, if you can get people in the door, you know, if you can sell them the sizzle, as he would say, <laughs> you're getting the conversation open, which is important. And so it kind of eased my mind and say, okay, I don't need to choose one. Just do what you want when you want to do it. And if I am doing more collage work, then I'm doing more collage work at that time. Yeah. If I'm doing more painting, because I'm in a painting program, but Crystal can attest, I haven't painted in a year. <laughs> I haven't painted, well it's coming up on a year, it'll be a year at the end of July, I haven't painted at all, I've just been cutting and cutting, and it's like, you know, what, you know, how does this speak to me, so I think that the main thing is the impact, and if I can open the door and make art accessible the way I need to make it, in order to make this other stuff relevant to yeah. them, you know, like, the collage work is a little bit more, um, and my observations and what I'm doing, but if I can get them in this way and expose them to this stuff, then that feels good to my soul. Yeah, I'm sorry, I just wanted to say real quick, like, Kama is like killing them both. Like, <laughs> I think for all of us, every time we look up, it's like, oh, Kama's doing this. <laughs> you know, she's got these three pieces, she's got this solo, so she's got, you know, so I, and we're all also dumb father dumbfounded by the fact that she's still teaching <laughs> while while full time in this program. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? Like it, she's a mother of 
to it. Like she's yeah. like mm-hmm. killing, and we're all just like, how the hell? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was just say, uh, and that's yeah. Kudos to you. <laughs> as someone that's a writer, artist, curator, father, as well, I, I kind of resemble that remark, but uh, this guy Preston <laughs> might have some kind of uh, feeling about that as well, because yeah, you're also doing think, multiple things. Yeah, I think, you know, number one, you know, success is, you know, being, I, I myself have a 14 year old daughter, so being able to provide for her is, um, you know, number one. Um, but I think, you know, given my background in architecture, like I said, coming from that, like, I had reached a level of success in, in that career, and I realized, like, looking at um, the people that were uh, above me, yeah. um, that they weren't happy, so, you know, no matter, you know, this level of wealth or success or whatever they saw as success, um, they still weren't, they, they weren't happy, so I think for me, happiness um, is success, and yeah. My art is a way for me to better understand myself. Um, so, like Crystal was saying, it's, but I see our, our art, you know, all the art that we create, it's a spiritual journey. You know, so better understanding ourselves and, you know, how to operate within the world. Um, you know, like David was saying, it's all energy at the end of the day. You know, you know speaking about your kids, and it's funny because I see you with your kids all the time, and my kids, and my kids are. And when I first started as an artist, like success for me was, I think I, I told you four years ago, is that I wanted to always wanted my kids to be in school. But you know, as I as you no know, uh, to piggyback on Kim, but you know, you see her take these different lanes and she's phenomenal at each one. And kind of where, uh, uh, again, piggybacking on a conversation I had with Mark years ago is like, you know, finding my own voice. So how I was able to do that was staying an independent artist and being a part of an art house, but then I still had leverage because how I started was I created my own exhibitions and I put together my own solo exhibitions to where no one could put me in a box. So if I wanted to make abstract work, then I could make abstract work. If I wanted to make content work, then I could make content work. But then from a respect factor, it starts to have to be to where, okay, how do I merge these two things together? Yeah. So now if you look at the work, if you look at my work, I found a way to take the story of a kid on the corner that's selling crack, but also to he has on Gucci pants. So you bridge these two, these two things and you create this beauty by painting the bridge, and not painting the specific experience for each way, to where high fashion can also be in the hood, but they still, you, you still have a beautiful model, even though his hair may be nappy and he might have diamonds in his teeth. Yeah. But you still, you, you, you paint the platform, the palette of what you presented on, and that's the art. But I learned that by doing what she does, and that's taking these, these different aesthetics, but then the more and more that you create from each one of them, and you kind of stay in your lane, they end up merging together. And at the end of the day, we're making art. Yeah. You know, we're all creators. <laughs> why, why let me just so it, Exactly. You <laughs> press an architect, and you make wood panels, and you grow plants, and, you know, and, 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 yeah. you can't forget the plants. Yeah. 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 No. No. <laughs> I, I always got to go back. I can remember when I didn't nobody pay attention to me. And that's what I did, right? And I can remember when I worked with Killer out of the years. Do you remember that? I think it was like an eight-year run. And I remember when I first started, we could put stuff out, and nobody would pay attention. And then what happened is the game went nothing. And then it got to a point where people were just watching. And then it took my attention off the edge, and I was ready to concentrate on what I wanted to create. And I kind of feel like that. At this point now, I can really get in the room and cook or something, see how far I can push the line and see if I can. And then it's a competition. It all, it's all intertwined, but it got to a point where it was just, I feel like that's the success of it. It, 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 was, it wasn't even about the money at that point, you know? Like, it's 
like all that's gonna come. Like, you just need to do what you need to do. Right. It's gonna all do what you're supposed to do. You know, you can't force nothing in that world. It's always a lot of work. It's always it's just work. yeah, you just gotta put your head down and just go. That's what feels good. This feels good. This is good. <laughs> I love this. I want to open it up to uh, questions, but uh, before we do, uh, please uh, join me in congratulating these artists for their show that you had. They were like what we call it HVAC, we pivot to all the time, black life. And uh, and what I like about the, and so when Molly reviewed the show, she spoke to the fact that 
upstairs was really good, and it really was really good. But downstairs seemed to be, you know, elementary, uh, and it is, again, the compliment that we like to do that is very important, that there's black life, that the that you go into your exhibition and you see how people are just living, that there is a humanity there, that it's not just protest. We like to say that we don't rep the community because in this society that means you have to make a statement about something. We are the community. And the thing that I like about this show that I'll miss about this show until we do another show, which I'm in Georgia, do another show, is that feeling of our humanity of who we are, and I compliment each of you uh, for, for bringing that to the table. It's a great show. Yes? I don't have a question, I have a comment. I am uh, an urban planning consultant, which means that I experience the same kind of income insecurity that you guys <laughs> experience. It's not like from one painting, selling one painting to us, one contract to the next. And so I just want to commend you for your commitment to remaining in the art world and to say how much it means to me. I'm a collector. I have no room. Any, I got stuff in my garage. <laughs> As a chick. I apologize for the fact that I won't be able to buy any of your work until I get a bigger house. But just the fact that you have the courage to continue to do what you do in the, in the face of the income security I've been really related to what Mark said. I don't have a family, but I have bills to pay. <laughs> so if I can just get enough work to pay the bills from month to month, I'm excited about it. So I just want to thank you all for what you do to open up the world to what you know, to our community, our culture, and what you have done for me here today. And what whatever day that was that Evita did her talk, yeah. you know, I had to get out of my my little office from in front of my computer. I managed to get over here somehow, and it just meant so much. And this is going to have the same impact on me. I just want to thank you guys for what you do. Oh, that's beautiful. Okay, we're gonna leave it there. Thank you, folks, for coming. Uh, please stay for uh, the. Uh, festivities for Juneteenth will be here till 4 o'clock today. Um, we have booths uh, and other events. And I want to encourage you, if you're not a member of the Houston Museum of African American Culture, we have a membership program that uh, starts as little as $35 but, uh, a year. And at the $125 a year level, uh, your membership at HMAC also opens the doors to a thousand museums in the country that you can go to and visit uh, by just showing them your HMAC membership. So I, we encourage you. All right, thank you very much. Thank you guys. So this is my high school classmate. <laughs>